pile, you find yourself in a darkly lit room. In the corner, the pale glow of a monitor shows two handsome men talking about Dungeons and Dragons. What do you do? I subscribe and watch more. God, I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> Welcome to Explorers. We're talking everything D&D. And on today's episode, we're talking about cutscenes, dreams, visions, all that wrapped into one. I'm Scott Micklejohn. I play Valentine on the Wild Cards. I'm Kyle Bryden. I'm the Dungeon Master to the Wild Cards. Uh, and yeah, we're going to talk about the utilization, particularly the utilization from a Dungeon Master's perspective of dreams, visions, and cutscenes, but also uh, the player perspective of receiving those things. So in your toolbox, your DM toolbox, why are these, they're all kind of the same thing. Why are they such a great storytelling tool in your opinion? They each serve such a really good purpose and, and they each set good elements. They set tone uh, that you can be used as reminders or hints to kind of get your players onto a certain path. But most of all, like they add intrigue and they add emotion. I think that's how I like to utilize them. So player perspective for me personally, God, I love these. Some of my favorite moments have been from a dream, um, from a vision, from a cutscene. Like honestly, I, I've enjoyed all of them, whether it's affecting me personally or witnessing it. Maybe my character Val isn't seeing it because obviously it's happening to someone else, but it's been so fun to watch it happen to someone else in my party and see how they handle it. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go one by one, Kyle, if that's cool with you? Why don't we talk cutscene first? Sure. Um, any wildcard examples you can remember in particular, maybe even before our stream for no spoilers, uh, where you've really enjoyed it? Uh, let me think of this. Like, there's, there's been a lot. Cutscenes is probably the one I've used least and is kind of the loosest of these three. Um, but my view is, as a DM of what cutscenes are is like a one-on-one -on -one character and DM moment. So like it would typically be, um, I, what, the way I use cutscenes probably the most would be in character death and in this kind of process mm -hmm. of resurrection. Uh, and there's been a couple of moments in our campaign on stream and pre stream, uh, where, where character death, I, I don't like it to be so cut and dry. And when you guys have been going through the process of rituals, uh, of, of raised dead or, and, and speaking with the dead in, in the kind of beyond, I like showcasing that because one it is a great tool for like making these moments impactful as players. Uh, you bring so much more emotion into something that could be so heavy. Uh, and I also like utilizing them as like just little, like little nuggets of like information and like, and things like that, that you can add in as a DM. Um, Pre-stream, uh, we've mentioned this in, in game several moments, uh, the kind of cut scene where, uh, an NPC of your team, Niavir, who you, we've mentioned in game several times. Uh, R.I.P. Yeah, R.I.P. Niavir. She she died in battle uh, and in 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 the abyss with you guys, and you Valentine have raised dead. And as you guys kind of left the dungeon you were in to try and bring her back, you went through the the ritual of raised dead. And can I pause you just before you say it? Absolutely. I rolled. This is my first time using this spell. I'm so nervous because we all love Nia Veer. She's our girl. And I rolled so high. Like, I remember rolling the D20. You're like, we're rolling D20. And I rolled it. And I it was in the high 18s. So I felt great. Yeah. <laughs> so now you tell yeah. the rest of it what happened. Yeah. Like, I like to keep the roll to make sure that, like, uh, like does the ritual actually work? Like, it, you have to go through a bit of a process to, like, make sure that it actually works. Based on, like, you guys were in the abyss. You went through a lot. There was, like, potential, uh, potential side effects to it. But, yeah, yeah roll aside, ultimately, I go through the description of you seeing Nievir in, uh, in her, in the afterlife, in the, what looks like the, the blessed fields of Elysium. Uh, and I, I love the, the ability then to describe these otherworldly planes, this outer planes, literally, this one is the closest you can get to heaven besides Mount Celestia. You know, these things are, they're beautiful, they're evocative. And I just, you just kind of get to just let it, let every descriptor flow. And it was, it was so nice, but it became a, uh, a very heartfelt moment when, and, and a very tragic moment when any of your, and you have a conversation and she says that she's found peace and she was not coming back. She couldn't come back. Yeah. Yeah. That was devastating. As our producer notes in the background, a lot of, a lot of tears at the table, especially Allie shouts to Allie. Yeah. That's right. Um, I felt very Maximus, like walking in the field of Elysium. <laughs> yeah. Like that's always my vibe. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that was so powerful. And then devastating when Valentina had to come out of that and, and then tell the others what happened. <laughs> Ugh, rough. Um, you know, I was also thinking if you're watching the wild cards, this isn't a spoiler. Uh, one of our characters, Gord, the tabaxi, he probably has the coolest fan art. You can check out his 20 questions video down here. Um, he has the secret deal with Orcus, the demon Lord. Mm -hmm. And you've done some cool cut scenes with like a herald of Orcus, or I guess like a messenger of Orcus and him kind of talking. I remember some very creepy ones where like a person made of worms was talking to Gord and yeah. that's been super cool to witness. Yeah. I mean, through all of these cutscenes, visions and dreams, having two, in our case, two warlocks in the party is just an invitation mm -hmm. to go fucking wild. <laughs> like I use these all the time with, with you guys, because warlocks have just so such interesting classes, such interesting characters and, you're tied to these figures of great power, immense power and ability that you can break and bend the rules as a DM for how they contact you, how they, uh, they mm -hmm. bend and change reality around you to give you warnings, to give you messages, to, to th threats in Gord's case, in some cases. Orcus is not super chill. So, <laughs> so he's like, a tough hang. Yeah, uh, it's it's really great to to bring out these cutscenes. Yeah, and and Gord has had interactions with Orcus through dreams and with uh, a messenger uh, of of Orcus uh, through these cutscenes that are just great for evoking fear and power and kind of remind like to to kind of pull pull him in the direction that his patron wants him to go. Uh, and it's like gentle pushing by, by DM, but never going too far with it. It's always about like, it's just a gentle nudge, even though it's Orcus and Orcus is pretty crazy. I never want to take player agency. I never want to take away um, anything of, of like, I'm never going to force something on you. It's going to be a, like a strong suggestion and maybe there will be consequences to you not going along with it, but that's just to like play out in the game. But those cutscenes are just, they're such a great way to implement some emotion, some fear. Oh, it's great. Okay, let's talk about that a bit. You were talking about dreams. And so Val, his patron, is the summer queen. But we didn't really like start. What I liked is Valentine was kind of discovering his patron. And he never made like a conscious choice. It was almost like there was like uh, a reach out from the divine and Valentine kind of made a deal and then was uncovering this pact he had made. And the more in tune with that he got, the more power he got. I guess even before patron, let's go back to, I don't know how, what level we were, like level seven, this is pre-stream and we go to Valentine's hometown and Valentine starts having bad dreams. Mm -hmm. um, that was so cool. If you want to talk about using dreams as a tool, I think dreams are my favorite. Dreams are, I think of these three kind of tie, it's close to, it's close to visions, but, but dreams are the most powerful because dreams have the most supernatural to them to me. Yeah, uh, true. You can really mess with your players in dreams because there's always that element of how real is this? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and you can really play with that as you do in, in film and, and, and TV all the time. Like having those dream sequences, there's an element of like, you know, it's a dream, but is it like how much of, of this is real? How much is portent? How much is just messing with you? Like there's so much fun to it. Um, and, and using well, and you them. talked about too, sorry to interrupt. You talked about too, you, you, you get the agency as a player too. So it's not like you're watching it happen to you. Precisely. What you do so well is you are leaving moments for them to talk. Do you do anything or you'll just stop talking and let that linger. And then you're like, shit, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like I've seen with Gord and Orcus when he has these Orcus visions, sometimes Orcus will ask a question and just let it hang. And then, buddy, you got to answer because yep. the demon Lord is right in front of you. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so I, I've really enjoyed those moments of like agency uh, with those dreams and the like evocative imagery you can provide just like you said because it's a dream you can throw out all sorts of stuff yeah but it also serves like active purpose as well in your storytelling um i like to utilize them as uh they're good uses for for info dumps of just kind of like uh things that your patron wants you to know or th that you're experiencing in the world um things that you are almost like uh, sometimes i utilize them as how i as a dm almost like assume or interpret how your character is is engaging with the world and kind of mm -hmm. reflecting through dream you don't really have control of your dreams in real life 
But as a DM, I can mold those dreams. I can shape what you're, what you're feeling. And then you can take away what you want to take away from those dreams. Uh, but they, I do utilize them more as tests, challenges, and conversations from higher powers, I would say. Yeah. And you, you've used them like really well as foreshadowing, mm-hmm. whether it's like on our channel, um, probably in like the high teens, if you're watching along, we won't post any spoilers about this, but they're at the end of one arc and the Kel arc, no spoiler there, uh, Valentine gets a bit of a dream and it definitely just foreshadows this is the next arc. Something is happening here. Yeah. Um, there's something going on with the patron. And, oh, it's just great. When it happened to me as the character, I just remember being, one, scared for Val, but so jacked up that, oh, cool. There's something happening with my backstory. There's something happening here personally that I have stakes in that I can now role play with. Exactly. And that was that's uh, another kind of key to all of these is the ability to, to pull in character hooks, to pull in backstory, and to both do that and then also use it as a path to kind of send you guys into the next plot point or to a certain location maybe or something like that and in this instance specifically and even to tie it back into pre-stream um with valentine utilizing visions and dreams as warning signs from your patron that something is coming or that something dark is happening around you Uh, i love that idea that your patron and you have this like interesting bond and all warlocks and patrons have this interesting bond but in your case like the summer queen is is watching over you so much that like it's bleeding into your dreams it's bleeding into your subconscious Mm -hmm. and she's experiencing everything around you and and keeping these warning signs that i can use as just like even if nothing is going to happen for another five or six sessions, just to throw that little nugget in the back of your mind, that is such a powerful tool. Uh, and, and it creates intrigue of the rest of the party too, for being oh, able yeah. to watch that happen. Um, I wrote down two things here. I'll just say one, our producer noticed this too. If, you, if you're a DM and you feel like your players aren't getting something, they need a little more exposition or they need a little nudge and you don't want to railroad them in a direction look, parties take long rests all the time. That's like part of the game. Yep. You have a long rest to, to feel so a character goes to sleep. A dream is a perfect way to just maybe spell something out a little more clearly with Absolutely. some imagery uh, to your to your players so, so they get it. I've been in a game, I distinctly recall a game playing um, in my early 20s where I just had no idea what our DM wanted us to do. And I remember sitting there role-playing the day and it was frustrating for both parties because the DM's like, Clearly the DM was trying to tell us something to do as the players were looking at each other like, fuck, I don't know what they want us to do. Like, what's the next step? So a dream, a clutch move to just be like, okay, here's your nudge. Um, The other thing I would say that you do that's really cool, uh, you were kind of talking about it earlier, is a dream can have an in real life, your character's real life effect. Like you've done something, uh, Val's had a dream where then when he wakes up, you're like, hey, roll a D8. And then it's like, by the way, you take this amount of cold damage or something. Then that's real scary as a character to be like, there's something going on so serious, perhaps in like a a different plane that it's affecting my character's health. Yeah, yeah, that that shit is always like such an effective storytelling technique. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I kind of want to, I want to come back to that in a second, but there's one that, that bleeds into the utilization of visions. But one last thing about dreams um, to kind of, carry on the point of like leading your player somewhere, or if they're not catching up onto something, how you can clarify. I love the use of dreams with conversations. Um, yes. I do that every now and again, where clarifying, um, we, you guys are in this kind of grand scheme of things at the wild cards against the Revenant vow. And you've been, you've been selected, chosen to be elevated to the status of heroes by the gods beyond. And every now and again, it's really useful just to kind of bring that as back as a kind of the culmination of, of an arc uh, to bring that reminder back. And I've had you had conversations through dreams, shared dream conversation with, with the gods above um, one specifically. And it's just like, it's just a quick like reminder, like here's some like, here's some like DM talking points that I, you know, I make it sound a lot more fancy and cool, but here's the things I need you guys to remember and like, just spark that like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is coming up or this is something we need to get to. This is important (laughs) to make sure little things aren't lost. 
Um, and I know some people might think that that is pushing too close to a railroad kind of scenario, but in my experience, I found that like the story you just said, I would rather us both be on the same page and headed in the same direction than either of us feeling lost. Exactly. And, and for um, like full transparency, full clarity, our game started out episode one with a shared dream, mm -hmm. bringing all of our characters together. Yeah. So there's been a through line of that as like a narrative. So yeah, it's just recentering it on, by the way, this is still happening. Our whole game has been about trying to stop the forces of hell from unleashing, you know, Asmodeus onto the material plane, blah, blah, blah. You know, stuff um, and things. <laughs> just your normal every day yeah. occurrence in Bessaria. <laughs> Okay, let's switch to visions. Mm -hmm. And I was I was thinking about it as you were talking. A couple of characters have had visions, whether it's um, we end up being able to scry later on in our game. But I was also thinking about Brawly, Priest Dream, had a vision um, to, that kind of led us to this um, almost like bloodline arc for her. And that was really neat because probably was a new addition to our game. And so then for you to be like, here, I'm going to put a spotlight on you so you can really feel like a part of this game, a part of this group um, and feel that importance. Yeah. Uh, my, my use of visions is in that kind of moment it is a bit of a one-sided kind of projection of information or imagery or feeling uh, memory in that case fits very well feeling, but I like to utilize like a, the mechanics of the game into visions as well. Um, in that case, that was, that was like a kind of a mid vision dream kind of scenario of like giving a, a path forward, but very vague of what that meant. Yes. And it didn't play out for a little while after that. Like it was still mm -hmm. like, you still had several games after that. It was just like a little nugget to drop in there of, of little information that would could pay off later on um, through through gameplay and through Al Alana's role play. Um, but yeah, visions have uh, are closely tied to dreams in the way I utilize them. But we have had a couple of instances where, yeah, spells can basically facilitate a vision. You have a vision of a scry or a legend lore, something like that. What would you clarify? Like, what what in your in your head separates a vision from like a dream or something else? Just if we're talking terminology. It's I, I think the difference is a vision. Like like I said, like a vision is as a one sided info dump. Yeah. You have less interaction with it. It's mm -hmm. literally me describing something that you are are seeing and or feeling or you know something like that. Whereas the way I utilize dreams is that I maintain player agency through it. So I will have like either a conversation where you still are interacting with it, or it's a uh, you literally like a like a nightmare. You're walking down an empty hall. You see this. What do you do? And mm -hmm. then it's like you're playing through the dream, almost like a, like almost like in a video game. Like it's kind of like that. Um, they're all very closely connected, but I think there is some some minor differences in how you want to use them. I think I want to talk about our, my favorite vision, and we all had one, and it was in the abyss. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask me what my least favorite part of all of our arc was, just simply from a being terrified for months, um, it was being in the abyss because you made the abyss so goddamn spooky. Be. And part of it was starting out with this. Mm -hmm. We get into the abyss. We have to traverse an ocean for like the tiniest bit, but we end up in this gloomy, terrifying forest. Mm -hmm. And then tell tell the group what you did to us. Tell tell the fans what you did. So you guys were headed into into the abyss and towards this dungeon of this necromancer, this grand necromancer on the level of like a Sirarak in, in in my world, but his name was Carval. Like he, he's that level. And he had the black staff, which was a part of the Revenant Val plot. It was a big moment that you guys were, were racing towards. Um, but I wanted to ensure that the, the realm of the abyss is horrifying. It's the mm -hmm. worst of the worst. You can go to hell and like, how's bad? This is worse. And I really it wanted was. to hammer that home. Uh, <laughs> it was. And, and uh, the way I love to use that is to really make it feel spooky and scary through the, the force of, of the supernatural and through mm -hmm. the effect of things that you don't necessarily know if are real or can't control. Uh, so in this case, uh, you guys entered this, this jungle section and you were making your way through this jungle of the abyss and uh, you entered kind of a certain area and I had you all roll a save. I believe it was a wisdom save, but it doesn't really matter. You rolled a save. <laughs> 
and I think for the most part, everyone but like one person failed. Yeah, it was it was a relatively high DC. I fully admit that. Uh, but again, it was enforcing that power level of the space is so evil. It's a challenge. Like it was a challenge. I think only Gord and maybe Hondo succeeded. Uh, no, Hondo didn't because I remembered what happened. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, I totally forgot. <laughs> yeah, something bad happened to Hondo too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I wanted to to do something really special for this to enforce like how horrifying this place was that. I, I based around this save and then I had tailor, tailored a, a vision for each of you. And it was a, as a DM and having played, we were, we were well into our campaign, having played a year and a half, maybe two years into, into the campaign. And I, after this amount of time of knowing you as people and knowing you as players, knowing your characters and your histories and your backstories, I pulled, what did you fear the most? What would each of your characters feel the most, fear the most from my perspective anyways? And I wrote a kind of small vision of something that you would experience this hallucination put forth by the abyss uh, that each of you experienced uh, in, in your own way. And then some of it had extra components after that uh and and you fucking nailed it <laughs> like i remember seeing it happen to others and i was like oh man that's like what they're afraid of and then you you said something about val it, like i distinctly recall you saying something like your mask is slipping and something else that cut so deep <laughs> to val that i didn't even think of it like i remember you saying it and it's shattering something inside me and val to be like oh fuck that is what val is most terrified of that people will realize he is super afraid. He is not maybe as charismatic or as um, like faithful in what they're doing in terms of if they're going to make it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it just, let's talk about Hondo. What'd you do to Hondo? Our boy blue. Hondo had, had Hondo had a weird fear. I forget the specifics of the vision, but ultimately, I just remember how it ended up. Yeah. yeah. That's the point <laughs> I was going to get to is uh, his was uh, like, I was kind of playing less on a fear and more of a vice. Hondo is a glutton for, many different things uh everything everything <laughs> but uh i made him need to consume a need a, a visceral need to consume something something weird something horrifying uh and ultimately it made him bite off one of his own fingers it was but the way you described it was so great because you said it like that you have to consume you find something like you, you gnaw and it, it's delicious and then yeah and you, you and as our producer mentioned there was multiple saves involved yes. it wasn't like you were just like hey by the way you're eating your hand <laughs> but you had it where that he failed the save so you described it oh my god it's it's incredible it's delicious then you had us come across him yeah. and describe it from our perspective of you see han though he's like got his back to you you can hear him like eating something and as he turns to you he's been eating his finger yeah, off and it was like, like yeah <laughs> pouring blood down his hand and blood oh. soaked down his chin it was just a it's a great moment to like try and pull out some evocative language and and just the scare tactics and scare factor of it uh but that, of course there's going to be the saves and, and elements involved in it but yeah the the other key element that i like to visions is keeping it singular keeping it one-sided like um each of you were like pulled away from the group when it happened mm -hmm. or you would see something and like you would see something in the distance and and you would be driven to go and check it out and in this abyssal jungle very quickly you guys were were splitting off and that uh, adds an element of fear from the rest of the party uh that like you know uh i forget uh alana saw some figures from her past who had who she had failed and who had passed That's right uh, and she like started walking away and Hondo definitely sprinted off into the jungle to go and eat his finger. <laughs> so it was just like a bunch of uses uh, and a bunch of creating fear and emotion, but like adding intrigue. And it was just such a memorable thing that we, we still talk about it. We, we still remember those moments. Uh, and it was all through the initialization of like the setting, drawing out, one of these these elements this dream vision and cutscene like you just using the power of a space or using the power of a figure a creature to to create these supernatural elements and if this is happening to you as a player um my my like theory on this is always it's more fun to share like if you get a vision and it's rattled you sure maybe like take a moment where you're like oh yeah like I, i'm just feeling a little rattled but like god just share it with the party it's much more fun to share a vulnerability to get people 
in the know these other players of what your character's fear is so you can have some personal growth mm -hmm. uh whatever the vision is um Momentum kind of stops in improv. We always talk about saying yes. Momentum always stops when you say no to something, when you don't share it, when you say no to an opportunity. Uh, so I would encourage you when appropriate, like share these things because as our producer noted, it's much, then it was a really cool moment where when we took our next rest, we could talk about these visions yeah. and have our characters realize like, oh, Brawley's terrified that she's let down people in her past. The people she gets really close to and cares about, she's going to fail them. Mm -hmm. Really cool, like RP moment and character moment uh, to deepen those bonds. And you don't We're going to wrap up soon. Sorry, you don't need sorry, to. Keep going. You don't need to um, just let it all out. You can let it out in little yeah. bits and pieces. Uh, like mm -hmm. it doesn't. You don't need to immediately share five minutes after it happens. You can, of course, but I think like letting letting little bits out it, it just trying to create those rp moments is is where these really shine continue we're going to wrap up really shortly but i just want to touch on scrying because we've done it in a very cool way uh in our game we end up this is not a spoiler we got a crystal ball we can scry on it it's it's both visual and auditory um what's that one spell i always screw that up i always think there's like one you have to choose from the one where you can see but not hear or hear and not see I uh, what it is. i'm not sure that there's there's definitely like scrying has that element to it like there's like augury there's you can go That's through it. uh find familiar and see stuff through the your familiar as well um and and uh, there's use of like legend lore. There are a bunch of different spells that give your players the ability to see something that isn't directly here. And it puts it all on the DM to kind of describe what is there. Um, admittedly, I have, I've heavily pulled inspiration from Critical Role from Matt Mercer's use of, of these uh, descriptions and this creating a scene and things that you see mm -hmm. to try and help the, uh, this, this moment kind of have more weight because I feel like having the ability to scry, the ability to see a vision of someone else and someone, something else. That's such a powerful thing and such a cool, like magic, like that's supernatural. Mm -hmm. If there's ever been a, something supernatural. Um, so I, I definitely have pulled inspiration from the way that Matt Mercer goes ahead and, and does these descriptions. Uh, but I think that's, it adds that element, that weight to, to the use of a spell where you, get something really interesting out of these visions and you get to be very evocative as well. It all falls under that same uh, use of like storytelling tone and emotion all kind of coming together. And if I was to give any advice and it's just from watching you do this and maybe from watching Matt Mercer do it, I feel like the best use of those is to treat the perspective as honestly just like a camera somewhere mm -hmm. exactly. like pretend the scry is giving it off and it's a camera somewhere in the scene that's watching it try not to get this like omnipresent like uh vision i think it's way more cool when it's like you're a fly on the wall you're witnessing it from here mm -hmm. you can't maybe see everything i love when you do that when you're like you can maybe see like some shadowy movement but you're you're only focused on this one thing that you're scrying on you can't really um perceive what's happening outside it mm -hmm. It's, it makes it easier on me and any other DM out there because one, you don't need to go crazy with the description. You can make it as as small as you want, and you can give very specific details as you as you want. But you don't need to give everything away. So you, if they scry on on the location of you know something where your big bad is doing something scary and nefarious, you don't need to give everything away. You can give them what you want to give away and what you think is 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 worth how they're acquiring this information if that makes sense totally all right final thoughts then scries visions dreams if we're going to wrap it all up when do you think they're super useful and then maybe when as a dm would you be like you don't need to use it here maybe avoid it mm. i think the the biggest thing here is like they are all tools to create intrigue they're tools to to lead you guys uh players in a certain direction um but it's all about the storytelling it's all about the storytelling it's all going to be what suits this situation best what suits the setting best what suits how the, my players are responding to something best um and kind of my final thought of the whole thing is before even going through some of these um check with your players and and make sure mm -hmm. that they're on board with some of the direction you go because some of these can go can go far and they can go emotional. They can, they can touch onto things that are, um, that are big, that are scary and they can be dark. Um, and 
making sure that your players are on board with that before and after to check in is going to make the entire journey that much better. Um, and as long as they're on board with it, it can really breathe life and that supernatural, like I keep talking about into the game and, uh, and really get, make it for some really interesting moments in the game. Yeah. As we say here all the time, Talk to your DM, talk to your party. It's all about having fun. It's not you versus them, them versus you. You're telling this story together. So just like you said, if you're if someone's being put on the spotlight, make sure they feel comfortable with it. Um, find that like perfect balance. And the only way to do that is to talk to your party, talk to your DM. That's all for us in this video. If you liked it, we got plenty more of these chats coming up on the channel. And if you want to see some more, I mean, talking about dreams, Kyle, we've got how to write your own backstory, how to do plot hooks involving character backstory. We got how to play online if you're curious about that as well. And tons more of that kind of stuff coming up on the channel. Yep. And of course, every Tuesday we have uh, another one of the wild cards uh, games. So check that out. And if you want to see more of these, consider subscribing. That's all for us today. If your DM has given you a very spooky dream or a very cool dream, or if you are the DM, please let us know in the comments down there below. Mm -hmm. But until then, Kyle, we'll see you guys in our next one.